this present So welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar, creating a positive uh, club coaching environment. The webinar is going to be 17 minutes. It won't be 17 minutes in, in total. Uh, we won't be no more than 17 minutes, but we won't uh, be we, we won't go over that at a time. Um, just regarding the webinar, just a few small things in terms of if you have any questions during the webinar, just put in the Q&A function. So on the toolbar, you'll see Q&A. Just put your question in there if you have any questions. And we'll also be using the chat function tonight a lot. So we'll keep the majority of the interaction through the chat function. So if you have any specific question you'd like to ask throughout the night, just put it in the Q&A function. If you have an issue with your sound or any issue with, with anything like that, you can just leave the webinar and come back in. If you have any questions or there are any issues, just put in the in, in the um, in the chat function and, we, and we'll sort you out, no problem. So my name is William Harmon and I'm National Ladies Football, the for, uh, for Ladies Football, as I said, with a remit for coach education. So I'll be, I'm joined by my colleague tonight, Aidan, Aidan McLaughlin. Aidan, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? How are you doing, folks? I am the Assistant Development Officer up in Ulster. So we're very lucky with, with two of us up in Ulster, where the other provinces are maybe only one. So delighted to be on tonight to assist you all. So any help you need, just give me a shout. Good stuff, guys. So Aidan be in the background work on the chat function. So any questions or queries that go along, lads, please don't hesitate to put them into the chat function or the Q&A. So just before we move on, like this is, this is a, probably our second of a number of webinars, coach education webinars, that's going to be taking place over the coming weeks and months. Now we've had volunteer webinars as well. We have, we've got a referee webinars. So there's loads of, of variety out there for you to, to, to tap into over the coming weeks and months. Last week or two weeks ago with the team building on and off the pitch. So if you would like to look at that one, it's on our uh, LJFA YouTube channel. Um, all these webinars are recorded. So if you just want to give a look at that on our YouTube channel, it's uh, looking at specific stuff in terms of what can you do on the pitch, on match day, or even outside of that to, to, to build a good team ethic. Uh, and in a few weeks time, we're going to be doing pre-season, uh, the return to the pitch with Keen O'Connor. That's going to be a very interesting webinar. We're going to be doing other things like how to be a coach on the sideline, uh, coaching the tattle. And as you see, we've a load of, of webinars coming up. So please, guys, uh, come on to those over the coming weeks and months. And you'll always take something from, from these webinars, but they're all going to be recorded and they're all going to be on our LGFA YouTube channel as well, if you do miss them. So what are we going to focus on uh, tonight? Basically, by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to determine the value of a solid club coaching philosophy. So what does that look like? Recognize the importance of knowing who you are and what kind of club you want to be. And identifying the key ingredients around developing a sustainable club coaching climate. And what we'll do is we'll give you a sample of what that looks like in a club setting as well, just to bring it back to the, to, to the grassroots as well. So what are we trying to achieve here? We're trying to create a high performing club culture. Now, when people hear high performing, they, they, they automatically think elite. And under uh, any club can be high performing. It means really how can you reach your potential uh, within your own setting. So every club is different, and every every club is there's big clubs, there's smaller clubs. So how can you reach your uh, your potential is what we're looking at. So how can you get a culture of continuous improvement, where you, the coach or your club, looks to improve every aspect of your performance every day at every level. So we're not saying to you about you're going to be the best, but we're just saying, how can we be better than yesterday? And maybe after this particular webinar, you might have a lot more questions than answers. We'd just like you to reflect on the content tonight. And over the coming days, think about what's being delivered and maybe just bring it back to your own context and your own club. And it might just get you to reflect on, on your current coaching practice, not only yourself, but in the club setting. Okay, so Aidan, we're going to get to cracking straight away. We're going to put in the type function. So everybody here tonight, could you just put the chat function? If I was to ask you now, okay, what word would you associate with a positive club coaching climate? What would come to mind straight away? So throw it in the chat function, and my colleague Aidan will, will, be, will be monitoring that. So what words come to mind when you see a positive coaching climate? So oh, they're flying in here, Will, so participation. <laughs> So how do oh, you keep everybody involved? Yeah, that's a, and we we'll look at that later on, later on, Aiden, as well. Yeah, exactly. Respect, supportive, fun, smiles, retention of players, happy players, supportive, encouraging, learning, friendly, Jesus, purpose. Yeah, yeah purpose. Yeah, Good. I like we, this one. All inclusive. All inclusive. I like it, Aiden. I like cooperation, it. welcoming, communication, playing for fun, not to win. 
And I suppose, Aidan, do you know, as, as more come in there, I suppose, how do we get a situation whereby all those words that have been mentioned there in the chat, how do we bring them to reality? Because sometimes we say all these words, Aidan, but how yeah. many times do our actions match that? And what influences that we can't, I suppose, achieve what we want to achieve? Does that, you know, that's, this is my observation, really, that how can we put our words into actions, if that makes sense? No? Okay, so, right. I'm going to try this. I hope it works. Uh, I'm going to put up a poll, right? Does your club currently have a, co a club coaching philosophy? So I'm going to put up a poll here. And I just want you to answer yes, no, or not sure. Okay, so I'm just going to launch this poll here. All right, so it should be there. So after you go, you're going to have, you know, as long as you want, just click yes, no, or not sure. Brilliant. Great stuff. Jeez, they're coming. It's like, it's like the Eurovision, Aiden. It's like the Eurovision coming in. So very interesting. So it's interesting to see. Yeah, we have a few more to come in on the poll, nearly there. Another 14 people. Excellent, guys. That's very interesting. So 80%, 80% of the participants who've logged in here already has said they're either they don't have a club coaching philosophy or they're not sure they have one. That's interesting now. That's very interesting. So hopefully tonight we might be able to um, give a bit more clarity around what is a club coaching philosophy. And maybe then at the end of the webinar, we might be able just to, to probably look at that again. So well done, well done. So I'm gonna just gonna move it on to the next one. Sorry, now I'm just moving on here. Now, I'm just gonna look at the next one now. And then we're gonna do another little poll. So we know 80% on the call tonight are not sure they have a club coaching philosophy or they don't, or they don't have one. That, that's, that's a very interesting one now for, for our webinar tonight. The next poll I'm gonna put up is, how would you rate your current club coaching climate? So in terms of the structure of the club, how you communicate, the environment that you create, you know, and the coaching practice. So the environment you create for your players and how your coaches interact at this present time. So I'm going to prop the poll again here and it's going to be the second one. So rate your club. So I'm going to launch the poll. So again, off you go. How would you currently rate your current coaching climate? So in terms of how you communicate as, as a wider club and the structure, the, the player, you know, the player and center of focus and your current coaches. Again, Aiden, very interesting feedback, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, well, I can't see the I can't oh, see the results. The no. So <laughs> I'm listening to your commentary here. Very, very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so very good. Geez, out of the 70 odd people that are here tonight, 66 have voted. That's interesting. So 40, 50, just over half feel that their current, um, I suppose, coaching climate or club is, is is either average or below. So and the rest, which is about, I'd say, 40% feel it's good or excellent. That, that's, that, that's good to hear. That's, that's good to hear, you know, that, that kind of you know, difference in terms of, of where we are with the clubs here tonight. But again, let's see what all this looks like, and we'll come back to it again at the, at the end of the... We have a few things in the chat here, Will. Just some people put in that COVID restrictions are maybe affected in the coaching climate within their clubs as well, so... I think that's a very good point. But, you know, let's, let's, let's go through the presentation and... If a scenario like the COVID, you know, happens, you know, next year again, which is probably going to be the case, we're going to be out of action for a while. How can we have a structure or an environment whereby no matter what's thrown at us, we can still go on and, and work together as a group? So just that's a good point. So hopefully we can answer that, Aiden, as we go along. So we'll move it on. We'll move it on. I hope I'm not going too fast, Aiden. So, right. Just key questions to reflect on. How do you know the condition of your own club? So if I were to ask all the 80 participants here tonight, you know, how do you know the condition of a club? How do you know your club is doing well? So do you base it on how many trophies you've won or is it on, 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 on numbers of coaches you have or numbers of parents you've involved or number of players you've involved? How do you know your club is not doing so well? So you might win nothing, but does that mean you're doing good or not so good? What needs improvement? How do you know what needs improvement? How do you measure that? How do you measure everything? What is the evidence? So these are just things to reflect on that we'll try and hit on over in the coming slides, okay? Is your club uncertain about their beliefs and important coaching efforts? So if you think about earlier on, more than 50% of people feel that you know, they're not sure or they don't have a club philosophy in place, then does that lead to uncertainty? 
I'm just throwing out there. I'm just throwing these questions out there. We're not looking for answers tonight. I'm just throwing them out there to you. So that uncertainty leads to inconsistency in behavior. So which leads to a fractured personal relationships, which creates chaotic club conditions. So what I'm saying to you is, if there's any bit of in, in uncertainty, uncertainty or inconsistency in how you go about your behavior, then it's possibly going to lead to some fractured relationships and maybe just chaotic club conditions. But we'll come into that in more detail shortly. So, okay, this is the essence of the workshop, okay? How do we create a solid club coaching climate? It's based on three center pillars. They are what's your objective and your purpose? What are your values? What, what you stand for, what you believe in? And, and what's your approach? So how will your club work? What are your guidelines? And we'll show you an example of a club one now in a few minutes. So we'll bring it back to the club and we'll see, well, this is all the theory, but let's see how it works in practice in a few minutes. So your values, guys, if you have your values, that underpins your philosophy and your coaching objective, okay? What is it you're trying to achieve? What is it you're about? What are you about as a coach? What's your club about? How are we gonna marry them together? And then your values will determine how you go about your business in terms of your approach. So just step back. How many times, guys, do we take the time to step back and just think about these things? So if you look at the outside, you see think, plan, do, review, and add to your learning. So this is a coaching principles in terms of we always think about what we do. We plan accordingly. We try it out. It goes well. It doesn't go so well. We review it. We add to already, already known that that continuous, I suppose, cycle of learning, it applies to your club. But the question I ask is, if you don't know what your purpose is, if you don't have your values laid out for everybody to see, and you're unsure about your approach, then how do you know you're improving, is the question I would ask. And that can apply to a coach on their own, or a club in a bigger picture, and that high-performing club. But look, this law makes sense now shortly. So think of your club like a bus. <laughs> it's a fine bus, Aiden. It's a fine bus. <laughs> okay. But think of your club as a bus. And what we're talking about here is your, is your values. And what we mean by your values is what underpins why do you do what you do? It's the building blocks. It's, it's the body of the bus. Without that, it'll fall apart. Then your values underpin your vision and your purpose. It gives you a bit of clarity. What are you about? Where is it you want to go? Does your club, are you clear where you want to go as a club, as a coach, as a coaching group? Then you need the driver. Who's going to lead this? So tonight I say, could you be the leader? Could you be the person that can go back and ask all the questions? Who's going to lead things? and ensure that the club is going the right direction, ensure that the club stays on track and reach their, reaches their destination. And sometimes guys, there's a core, all you need is a core group who believe in that, who have clarity around that. You don't need a mass amount of people, just a core group of people. And then we're gonna have the passengers. Who do we need to get on board to get us to achieve our goal? Is that players, coaches, parents? How do we achieve that? And that's difficult. How do we get everybody to sing off the same hymn sheet so we're all still going the one direction? And then there's the exhaust. What do we need to stop doing? That's our, what is limiting our progression? Who in the club are having a negative vibe to what we're trying to do in the direction of the club? And they're just things to reflect on. And think about your own club. And put the analogy here of the bus. And where do you fit in all this? Okay. Well, we have a question here. I do think we'll cover it later on, but I think it'll be it'll be a question probably most people on, on the webinar here are actually thinking. How do you handle detractors within your club? They might have a fixed mindset and that can derail your approach. Yeah, will we leave that for later on, Aidan? Yeah, I think, I think we will cover it, but it's probably something that I'd say a lot a lot of the participants yeah, will, yeah, will be interested in. And a, and a great question, and a great question. But I suppose the simple answer is, you need to have clarity about where you want to go first. And then let's see look where it goes. But I'll come, back to, I'll come back to that shortly. I just have about two or three more slides to go through. And then I think we'll get into all the nitty gritty stuff like that. Yeah. That's a great question. 
um, and, and we'll come back to it, so no problem at all. So let's look at more detail. Let's look at these three areas and then let's go into a sample club environment and let's answer all those questions. What is the purpose objective of your club? What, what are we about? So you are listening here tonight as a coach. I'm a coach. Why do we do what we do? So what matters, okay? At the end of the day, guys, our purpose is to create a player-centered environment that we look after our players, that we have more players playing our game, that the players, irrespective of what we do, is the center of our decision-making. We want to create a fun, stimulating, exciting, exciting environment. People that feel worthy, feel confident, that they feel they're getting better. We as clubs provide that opportunity for our players to get and stay involved in a game. But for that to happen, we have to have our values and we have to have our approach right. But we'll go through that again. So the player is the center of our focus. What are we about here, guys? We want more players, better players, playing longer. That's what we're about. So if you're an underage coach listening here tonight, your role really is to develop players for the future. In a nutshell, for your club, your role is to develop players so that they're going to be playing hopefully 10 years time. That delayed gratification, they call it. How do you feel that you, know, you had a role to play in that girl staying involved in your club? And if you're a player or a coach here tonight that's coaching adult players or maybe girls from 17 upwards, your role then is to get the girls to achieve their goals and ensure they sustain a love for the game and stay involved. But what we also want is more coaches, better coaches, if we have more coaches, better coaches, we'll have more players, better players. So let's see how we achieve that. So what do we mean by philosophy? Okay. What do we mean by philosophy? It's something important. And I, and I would say to you guys tonight, we speak about COVID earlier on. Use this opportunity to really, really look at this now in your club. If you have a strong coaching philosophy, it will most certainly strengthen your club. It guides you. It gives you direction. It interprets your events and what happens. Gives you the fundamental answers to why we do, what we do, and how we're going to go about it. And the point made earlier on there regarding how do we deal with personnel that may be going against the grain, you need to have something to work off in order to be able to deal with these scenarios. And I'll go through that shortly. Determines how we view things, how we interact with people. It determines our values. Okay? This will all make sense shortly. So why do we need a club? And this is going back to your point earlier on, Aiden, that they came in. You need something to work off that will help you make the best, the difficult decisions. It's not about personalities. How can we remove that emotion that it's my opinion versus your opinion? It's not. It's the club. This is as a club what we're trying to achieve. This is the role you play in it. You, you know, this is what we expect of you. It removes uncertainty about training rules. Okay, so a coach says to the club, I want to train the under eights four nights a week. Well, no, sorry. As a club, as coaches, as a group, we've agreed one night a week is sufficient with one uh, game opportunity day. So it's the club that's making all the decisions. Not a person. The club coaches, the club parents, the club leaders are making these decisions. So therefore, it's no longer about personalities and opinions. It's the club. How do we develop a style of play? Discipline. If someone steps out line, well, this is how we deal with it. But if we don't have anything in place, then are we doing an ad hoc approach? Is the same issues always happening every year in your club? So just think about that. Code of conduct, how we approach competitions. I'll show you that in a few minutes in an example. Short-term, long-term objectives. And people talk about winning and how we balance that winning. Winning is important because you know what? You, you like to win as well. Of course. It's a nice to, to feel you can win but it shouldn't supersede everything, okay? How do you get the building blocks in place to get you an opportunity to win a game? But if you don't have those building blocks, I don't know will you win too many games or competitions. But the other side of it is, not everybody can win, guys. One team or one club can win a competition. So if, if we base ourselves on winning all the time, then we're, we're going to think we're, we're unsuccessful, which is not the case. Go back to the point I made earlier on. What is success to you as your club? So before we go into the final few slides, 
we have to look at our values. This is number two, our values and our beliefs. These are the LGFA values and beliefs. The question I would ask you, what are your values? What are your beliefs? The question I would ask you is, what are your club's values? What are your club's beliefs? If you ask your club in the morning, can you see them? Are they ready, readily available? Does your values and beliefs match the clubs? It'll determine how we behave. Simplistic. So if you, it's very important we align everything together. So our final slide before we go into the interactive and we listen to, you know, we look at an example and also we look at, I suppose, you know, get, go to all the questions that came in. What are the three key things required to get a solid approach? Number one is your club structure and your system. Okay, so what we mean here is you need a good functioning club with good leadership. Leadership from the top. You need everybody in that leadership roles to believe what they're doing is right and to understand it. You need to lead to influence. So the question I'm saying is you need strong leaders to be able to lead a positive coaching environment in your club. You need effective communication. I'm just going to throw out a few questions to you in your own mind and think about this. How many times do coaches in a coaching team, so I'm with the under 14s, I'm with Aiden. How many times do we speak outside of the tra training session about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve? How many times does myself and Aiden on the 14 management team, our coaching team, link in with our fellow coaching units, the under eights, the tens, the twelves, the fourteens, the sixteens? How many times do we talk to each other about what we're trying to do as a bigger picture? How many times do the club and the leaders of the coaching group talk together? So that communication, think about that. How do we measure success? How do we measure? I'll show, I'll show you an example shortly of how we measure success in our own club and hopefully that, that'll give you a bit clarity around that. The club environment. How do we have an environment or, or um, a, a climate that promotes player-centered learning? That it's about the player. It's not about the coach. The coach is there to facilitate learning. It's about the players and getting players better. How do we get there? How do we, how do we require those standards and those behaviors? And go back to the point that, let's go back to the point made earlier on, but how do you deal with those people who are going against the grain? You need to be clear on what you expected of people, what are the appropriate behaviors, and what we are as a club. Do we have that though? Do we have it? I don't know. How do we create culture and identity? Coaches and players buying into the bigger picture. How do we maintain behaviors? And finally, that coaching practice. How do we get the best coaches involved in our club? And maybe the coaches coming in might be the best coaches, but they're willing to learn and develop and get better. So how do we support and guide people? So when they come into the system, they're learning and they're getting better and they get, and as they go along. How do we know they're all conducting the right activities for their age groups? How do we know that everybody's doing a coherent approach to coaching? That the under-8s are doing one thing that's going to help the under-10s next year. The under-10s are doing something that's going to help the under-12s next year. That not everybody's working in a tunnel vision. So, less of the jargon. That's me. That's the presentation. I'm going to show you what this looks like in a club. I'm going to show you my own, uh, our own clubs and coaching guidelines that looks at the philosophy, values, and our approach. So maybe that might make a bit more sense on what we're doing. So I'm just going to stop, stop the share here a second, guys. I'm just going to go into this document here. And Aiden, you can let me know if it's up. Can you see that, Aiden? It's, yep, it's up now. Okay. This is a real life um, coaching guidelines in our own club. Can I just say to people listening here tonight, it took about four or five years to develop this. We all started you know, uh, as a club. And this was developed by all the coaches in the club, the leadership in the club, got feedback from parents. So this is developed over a number of years. It took about four or five years. Does this mean that our club is running smoothly? Absolutely not. We always have concerns and issues and, and things that are going on every year like, like every club has. But whenever something does happen, we go back to our guidelines. It's about our guidelines. What did our guidelines say? Okay, what's the concern? What's the issue? Why is it an issue? What does our guidelines say? Now, how do we deal with it? We have something to go back on. Okay, so look at you here, our coaching philosophy. There it is. 
Clear participation, enjoyment, development, performance, and retention are key priorities a long term of philosophy approach. So that just gives you an idea of what we're going after. Look at our values. These are things that we didn't get out of a book. We sat down as a group of coaches and we said, what are we about? If we were to write them down, what are they about? We wrote them down and we put them down on paper. And look at our approach. This is developed. I suppose when we first started this a number of years ago, there would have been only three or four points in it. But because of experience and learning and things we came across and doing wrong things and right things, it developed as it goes along. I'm not going to go through it in detail, guys. I have no problem sending this out to all coaches afterwards if you want. There's no problem. No problem at all. But you just give a look there. As you see, we've a, we have a, a coaching working group. What that means is that all coaches involved with all age groups, we meet at least five times a year. We just sit down and talk about football and say, how are things going in the club? Are we meeting our aims, objectives? Is there any issues, any concerns? What can we do to try and solve them? That's basically it. Try and meet five times a year if possible. And you're talking about COVID there earlier on. You can still do those meetings on Zoom if you feel. We have here, we have each club, we, we, we go after this one to eight ratio. So every player or every, I suppose, coaching group in our, in our club, we have one lead coach and we have three assistants with them. Four years ago, we had about 25, 30 coaches. Over the ladies football hurling and, and the football in our club, we have now 65 coaches. We went after it because we said there was too many coaches, I suppose, under pressure at the time. They were taking too many teams. They were under pressure. They couldn't get people involved. So we said, you know what? We have to really go after this. So we, we worked on it. We worked on it. But after a while, we got there. So we've no duplication roles were possible. But I'm just giving you an idea. Okay, here are our train to play guidelines. Look at them there. I have no problems in the demand you afterwards to give a look at them. So this is from ex you know, our experience. We're saying, right, okay, if we've got two teams in one age band, so we have two under 12 teams, this is how we're going to approach it. This is how we're going to go about it. We have our guidelines. Our under 12 16s regarding game time is what we're going to do. As a group of coaches, this is what we're agreeing to do. It's not an individual opinion. It's not a club coach's opinion. And every coach that comes into the club, we go through this every year. We have three meetings. We have a review meeting now coming up shortly. Okay, we'll review this. But before we start every year, this has gone through with every coach. We go through every line to make sure they're clear on what we're trying to do. But also what we need to do is get this out to their parents. So the parents are, if you, if you really believe in what you're trying to achieve, you need to promote to the parents. I think that's one avenue our club needs to work on. We need to get this out to the parents now more. And um, we're actually thinking of putting a little poster up to get out there. But look at it all there, look. In terms of game time, in terms of, you know, training, in terms of, um, okay, game opportunities. So we're saying if we need more games, we're going to be proactive. You know, give an example, or we didn't, we have under 13 players who were, you know, probably, you know, we want to give them more game opportunities. So we set up more challenges and stuff. But there they are. Look how we select our teams. If someone steps out, you know, it's just, you know, going against the grain and what we're trying to do. How do we achieve it? What do we do? Our attendance to monitor drop off So everybody takes attendance in every session. So if someone steps out or we haven't seen them in three weeks, we'd pick up the phone to the parents and ask why. Why? We're starting our player pathway. What do, every, what do we need to be doing in each, each age group? Just get every coach in a room and, and, and let's have that discussion. We have our code of conduct. Players, coaches, and parents sign up to this. So when they register for the club, they're signing up to this. So you're telling us when you sign this that you know what you're abiding to what we're trying to achieve as a club. But if things go belly up, then again, we have something to go back on. We need to promote the parents, which is hugely important. That's something that we need to promote better in our own club. And if there's any concerns, issues, that's how it works. So what I was just doing there was, I suppose, I was just showing you that what we're promoting tonight has been tried and is currently being tried in our own club. I have no problem sharing that with you, but that came from three, four years of constant just talking. We started off, I think there was only one meeting in the year where we just sat down and said, what are we trying to achieve? What's our goal? What are we trying to do here? Then as every year went on, we reviewed it. What can we do better? You know, go back to the point of what can we improve on? Okay, let's amend our guidelines. Before we start the year, we go through them with everybody and things like that. So look, I think Aiden, I've, I've done enough talking. I, I hope I kind of just gave a synopsis, but. I suppose the question I would be asking people now is, what are the challenges, guys? I know there's people going, what are the challenges? So if there's any questions, Aiden, that are coming in, 
Oh, yeah. No. There's a few here, yeah. Yeah, off you go. There's a few people put in to be very keen to get the slides, but I think you'd know better. Yeah, Lady so, football, go so, your head. So basically, Aiden, this this is we're recording this workshop tonight, so the yeah. slides will be available. Yeah, and I have no problem that our own coaching guidelines there for the club. Uh, send an email to william.harman at lgfa.ie. I'd be no problem sharing that document. And I'd have no problem showing you the, what we did every year, just to show you that it doesn't happen overnight. But I, we're like a lot of coaches here tonight, I suppose. We asked all those questions. How do we get more people involved? How do we get a more kind of, I suppose, structured approach to what we're doing? So I have no problem sharing it after, Zayden. Another one here, with two more here at the minute, is in the, regarding the player passe, would the ladies' football one be the best to follow? Well, I think we will say yes here, won't we? Yeah. Look, what I would say, Aidan, is ladies football have an excellent competency chat. Yeah. And, they, and, I, and if anybody wants to look, it's on our website. It's a, it's a club. And that you can edit that to suit your club. But I would say that use that only as a guideline. Don't just take the ladies football co club co competency chart and just stick it up in your wall in your club. I would say take that as a guideline. Sit down with your clubs and say, okay, we're looking at our club at all the demands of our game. What would we like to see in each area? And pick out what's specific to your club. Then what you do is you've got club coaches buying into it and it's now applicable to your own club. So I definitely think it's called the LJFA Club Competency Chart. It's on our website. It's excellent. But I would say use that as a guide, as a guide but have your own conversations and come up with your own one. Anything else, Aiden? And we have one more here. A few people are asking for your email address, but I'm sure we can, we can hand that out at the end. Yeah, I'll hand it out to you, no problem at all. And are we running any coaching qualifications online during COVID? Yeah, we will be. We will be. So if you want your coaches to be, um, I suppose, to develop a, a, as coaches, we'll be, we're starting to do blended online fundamentals in level one. Uh, yeah. And a few people are saying here that just the ladies side of their club, they're, they're trying to be really proactive using this approach, values and philosophy, etc. But their GA club is in the dark ages and other people are saying that they're, they're executive, it's gone a bit stale and that's a problem. But I suppose the question I would ask you is, is that ladies club, are they integrated? Are they, so in my own club, we are, we're an integrated club, okay? But the ladies football look after their own governance, as does the hurling, as does the football we all work together in terms of what we're trying to achieve okay so i suppose i'd ask that question maybe are they integrated are they but still though you need to do what's best for the ladies football club as well in your section so there's nothing stopping you probably trying out this in in, in, in you know having those conversations with your ladies football coaches or maybe maybe after tonight have a have a sit down with all the the leaders in the in in, in across the gaelic games club in your club and have these conversations look guys you know there's something i learned this during the webinar you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And have the conversation. A few more here while they're flying in here. No bother. Keep them coming. Keep them more coming. More than there. Do you suggest bringing in an external overall football coach to advise all club coaches? Yeah. So I suppose if we bring it back to the Gaelic Games context, Aiden, wouldn't that be your coaching officer? So I'm actually, yeah. guys, I'm actually a coaching officer in my own club, Aiden. So I'm the coaching officer. So my role is to implement the guidelines as we're trying to achieve and probably help our coaches or guide our coaches to be better coaches. But we work all together. So I assist with the ladies football and hurling as well. While there's a ladies football person that oversees the ladies football and the hurling person that oversees the hurling, my role is to work with everybody to support them in trying to develop the coach. So I would say, I would say yes, where possible, if you've one person overseeing the coaching quality in your club, I think that would be a good, a good idea. But maybe not just one person, maybe you have two or three people in that. You don't have to have just one person. Keep them Another one, yeah. How would you introduce ladies football to a club which already has a long camogie history? How do you get the camogie coaches involved? Sit down and have the conversation. Yeah. I, I honestly believe that. Sit down and have the conversation. Who are the key influencers in, the, in, in that club regarding the camogie? Sit down and have a chat and say, look, we're thinking about setting up plays football in the club, or we want to develop, how can we work together to achieve this? And have the conversation. Yeah, that, was that, that, that was just happened in my own club recently as well. So <laughs> it would be very camogie orientated and ladies. There was, I think they counted there were 67 girls going down the road to play for another club. So I think. At the end of the day, I suppose, at the end of the day, guys, what's important here is whether they're playing camogie, soccer, basketball, ladies football, we're here to promote girls to be active. 
So if we all can sit down and have a chat about how we can make that work, then let's have those conversations. And I'm going to put it back on you tonight. If you feel that you need to make that conversation happen, then just get people in a room informally and just ask the question. Next one here, because it's actually good to see some of the coaches are actually chatting to each other in the chat here and helping each other and giving some examples of what's happening in their clubs. So what is your advice on how to commence the conversation in the club on your values and coaching philosophy, et cetera? Yeah, what we did, will I explain what we did? Okay, so what we did was we brought everybody in the room and we asked three questions, okay? What words would you like associated with our club? And so there, you know, okay, what words would you like associated with our club? And we just ask, okay, how are we going to achieve that? <laughs> so we asked that question, so how, what words would you like associated with our club? From that, okay, what kind of coaching philosophy are we going to try to adopt? And the third question was, how are we going to go about it? As simplistic as that, Aiden, is that how we yeah. started it? And I suppose um, I'm going to show you another slide at the end here. There's another one you could use. But that, keep it that simple. And you know what, guys? You might only do one or two things differently next year that will improve it. But if you keep having those regular conversations, you will be amazed how they develop. I have no problem saying in our own club, we started off with, you know, how do we make sure every coach is key to the dressing room? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you know, or access to the pitch or having gear. But now we're talking about clear pathways. We're talking about, you know, longer term development. But that takes constant conversation and regular conversation. I think I'll go back to your point earlier on about how do you deal with the coach that is going, I suppose, the opposite direction to where the club is going. It's very simplistic. Don't make it personal. That's important. I just want to make that point. Everybody's doing their best to do the best job possible. That's key to recognize as well. But if you have your club guidelines where everybody agreed at the start of the year, where they all sat down, you go through them, what is it? you give them an opportunity to ask questions and you know, trash it all out, and then they, you know, they sign their code of conduct. If a person then decides to do their own thing, then at least you can have that conversation. So look, look, I see, look, we noticed last week, you know, you know, you kind of you know, went against grade X, Y, and Z. Look, this is what we're trying to achieve in terms of our club. Why, why do you feel you need to go down this route and have those conversations? Another one that comes in there is, I suppose, when we first started, well, I, I suppose it's that, you know, where coaches dictate the clubs, who they coach. Do you ever have that? I, I'd love to throw it out to coaches where, I, you know, the coach comes up to the coach. I'm trained on the 12 next year. And you're kind of going, yeah, great. We need people. Yeah. But that leads to possibly problems on the road because therefore, you know, you don't know they're going to abide by what you're trying to achieve. Whereby what we do in our own club at the moment uh, in, in the club here is that the club decides who the coaches and who coaches the coach are the, the teams because we want the best people possible coaching our team. So it's important that we, we look at that. And only one here, and I think it'll cover a lot of the participants here online as well. So Mary has said they've asked 20 of their senior team, past and present, to help out, to find it next to impossible to get anyone. What advice would you give to change this? Okay, so let's go back to my own practice. I'm going to go back to my own practical experience. I think that's the best way, Aiden, because I, I don't want to bluff. And I don't, but I suppose we were trying to improve that as well. So what we've done is we've, we've gone and started very, very, uh, we're going to integrate it. Very, very um, simplistic. So what we've done is we put a rotor system with our senior players that they come to the academy in the morning uh, for an hour, once every. So there's what, 20 odd players in the senior panel. So they might come to the academy once every six weeks. So a player, so you're integrating him in a nice, informal way to help out. Then we also have some players that will help out with the underage teams, but they're not the lead coaches, they're assisting with the lead coaches, and they can come when they can. So we're trying to introduce that, that idea. Past players, again, it goes back to another just a, a suggestion, is ring them. Get them into a room, outline what you're trying to achieve, and ask them, could they assist with, or maybe have they an opinion or thoughts on how they can help in with getting involved. So again, it's picking up the phone. It's maybe getting into the room and explaining to people what you're trying to do. But I think the rotor system of getting senior players involved is, is working well for us this year. Yeah. Anything else, Aiden? Oh, yeah. There's, they're flying in here, Will. So keep coming. Keep coming, yeah. You'll be, ti you'll be tired by the end. So next one. Let me see where we're at. How do you protect coaches from irate parents? That's a very good point. Um, first of all, I think we need to be kind of proactive rather than reactive here. And 
my advice here would be if you have coaching guidelines, I think it's vitally important the parents are aware of them. So I'll give you an example at the start of the year. Sit down with the parents with the management teams and go back to that lead person in your club, if it's a coaching officer or whatever, and just go through. If you believe in your guidelines, then print them out and give them to everybody possible. Give them out to the parents, go through exactly what you're trying to achieve and go through the role they play. If parents are not happy with something that went on, then you can inform them that there's a process where they go by, where they come to the, the, the chairperson of the club and they can deal with the concerns and the issues. So what you're trying to do is change the culture about how we go about things. It's unrealistic to think they're going to keep everybody happy, Aiden. I think that's true. Yeah. I don't think we're going to keep everybody happy. But if people are aware of what you're trying to do and are aware that if they have an issue or concern, that they know where to go to and that are listened to, that's important that they're listened to, then I think people will respect that. But I think it's vitally important that parents are aware of what you're trying to do, also the role they play in helping you develop that. I think, I don't know is our communication where it should be at. That's probably the, the key point I'm making here. Do you think you should not coach your own child? Look, there's another thing out there about, I suppose, Aiden, about parents and parents coaching kids. And I'm a parent, okay? So does that mean I can't coach? I'm a parent and my young, my young daughter or my young fella, whoever may be, might be involved. I just go back to, if that person's the right person and they understand what you're trying to do, then I see no issue with a, par- with a parent uh, coaching their own child. Maybe what I would recommend is try not to have, give the pressure of that person being the lead coach. I would say they'd be a support coach on a team, but have the lead coach where they wouldn't be a, a parent of a child because therefore you're putting pressure on that person. But I would think if, it's very hard to get people involved, guys, at the end of the day. Let's be honest about it. You're going to need your parents and people to help out. But I would say bring them in a system whereby, A, they're not the lead coach if, if their daughter is involved and maybe they're in a supporting role. That would be probably an advice. I don't know. Try it out. That's what we're learning. But also, I would probably recommend is get the right people involved with the right age groups. I think that's the more important. If the person is a good person and they want to do the best for the kids and the players, then I see no issue. Would you consider how you want your team to play and the style of play as part of your coaching philosophy? Yes. So our own club is, we want to be a kicking club. So there's your answer. <laughs> but we agree that as a, as, as a, as a whole as coaches. So for example, um, as all our coaches from their sixes to senior in the same room, one's at least three to five times a year, you know, we said in our player pathway, well, look guys, at the, under, at the under eights, it's important that the girls are practicing their kicking early. You know, because we want them to kick early. So is there, I know other clubs and what we're trying to achieve in our own club is that they'll be able to kick off both sides and hand pass off both sides by the age of 12. You know, that's, that's what we're trying to do in our player pathway. No, it's going to be difficult. It's going to take time. But that's, so our under eight coaches know that every session they do, we're working off both sides of the body where possible. That's what we're trying to achieve. So yes, my answer would be yes. Where you have more than one coach for a particular team, how do you, how do you decide between them? Do you allow players or parents to have a voice or do you keep it within the committee level? I suppose, for the start, and I, I suppose it's just learned by experience here, guys. I suppose from the start, I think it's important that the club take a lead role. I go back to that role of leadership and leadership from the top. I think it's important that the club take a lead role early in terms of denting the right people for the right age groups. I think that's where the club would take a lead role in that. That's just an, an opinion and a thought. Um, I suppose as you go up the age groups and the older age groups into the adult level, then obviously getting the feedback from uh, players would be important. Um, yeah, but I'd be thinking, I think if you want to change culture and tradition, then I think the club would probably early have to take a lead role in terms of identifying the right people. Uh, for their, And look, guys, you're not going to get it right all the time. In the there's, there's just a lot of, the coaches are, you know, they're talking to each other about different problems or different things they have maybe done in their club as well. So if you have any more questions, folks, keep, keep sending them in. There's, there's another one there in the Q&A, Aiden. If we went to the Q&A, I think there's a few questions in the yeah. Q&A. Um, I think there's four there. So we had covered some of them already in the answers, Will. Okay. So you had covered them, so that's why I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. So we covered Adams there. We covered how would you introduce ladies football to the club, which is a long Camogie history, and people are asking for your email address. <laughs> no bother, no bother, yeah. no bother at all. So let me see with more. 
Is there any other questions, Aidan, that you want to pose there? Is there any questions that we haven't probably hit on? Because I know, um, you know I'm just conscious of time. We've probably another about 10 minutes left. So I just want to, you know, if we... Before a lot of them have been covered. The big one is always parents. How do you get them aboard? And there's you've covered that a million times. So commit, not just parents. People have mentioned senior pairs there as well. So yeah. there's loads of ways that, that you can do that as well. I'm just thinking things off my own. Back players playing their own age group. Well, yeah, that's that's something there, guys, with the player playing your own group. You need to, like, if you look at the guidelines we have, I suppose what we're saying, if we have enough players under 12 or under 14, then we do not touch the under 12s. If we have enough players under 16, we don't touch on the 14s. Okay. So that's just our guidelines. So all the coaches know that, you know, that's how we're going to work in the club. If you have, um, I suppose, multiple teams within an age group, then in our club, we go down to stage development. So, like, we, we, we tried the older players first, and then, you know, so we kind of changed around this year. So we went to stage development. So we found that. Maybe a girl who might be older might be on the, you know, shall I say the stronger, maybe more perceived team, stronger team, but they mightn't be touching the ball. So you're saying, is that, is that player really improving? Whereby if she's in this scenario, in this structure, she's touching the ball more, she's developing, getting better. But the key to that is let the parents know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and there'll be no issue. Okay, that's just keep that communication open. Okay. Okay. What about head coaches who are also parents remaining with their children's group for four years or more? Okay. I'm just going to give you my opinion here, and this is straight out. What we do in our own club here is that we don't give anybody a set amount of time when they're involved with teams. We review it every year. So we're saying, you're involved with this team this year, okay, and we we'll review it at the end of the year. We might switch it up. Uh, the club might switch it up at the end of the year uh, based on the experience and stuff. But we don't, uh, I suppose, the club here, just, unless now you're with the 16s and older age groups, you might give them a two-year term maybe and just say, look, be with them for two years. But what we generally do is you're, you're assigned to a, an age group for the year, but it's reviewed every year. That's just what we do, but that doesn't mean that every club has to do that. Sure. Well, I know a few coming in here now. I was involved with the ladies team last year as the assistant trainer or coach. All went wrong with her manager and we didn't win a game. I had been asked to manage the team this year. How did I pick them up? You focus on what's important. If your focus is on winning games and, 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 and you know, winning the games, if that's success to you, you're going to be in trouble because the girls will deem winning a game as the end all be all. Focus on what's important. Today, girls, you know, today we're going to work on our kick passing. We're going to really work. You know, let's, we're going to observe that now. How many kick passes now and how many do we give away? Do you know, we, we'll try and get 10 points here today now. Let's try and get point, 10 points. Let's try and not concede a goal. Do you know, let's get four or five good blocks in today now. I'm going to watch them now. If we do them very well, let's see what happens with the result. But don't worry about the result. So you're changing the focus. How many times do we have a situation whereby if we win the game, you're deemed successful? I've seen very good teams play very well and still lose games. Okay, so that's the other side of it then, is the, what is the focus of the coaches? If the club backs you as a coach to say, we're not interested in terms of what you win and lose, we're more interested in how many players you stay involved and how they're improving, developing. That's what we want. So you have to change what the success looked like and support your coaches on that. Because sometimes coaches feel that if they don't win, they're not successful. We want more players playing our game. We want better players playing our game. So we have to focus on the right things and not the noise. I hope that helps. Yeah. How do you change the senior executives thinking when they're old school and you're under the umbrella of the men's club? Um, there's an opportunity every year and it's called the AGM. You know, um, if you feel that the club is not going the direction you'd like to go and there's a few core people with, then every year, everybody's getting an opportunity to be part of a club. Uh, there's nominations, put your name forward. And if you feel that change needs to happen, then why don't you take the lead? Why don't you get in the position and, 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 and take the, the bull by the horns? And just throw it out there that, it, you know, sometimes we have to probably just, you know, if we want real change, probably we need people to stand up and probably take a bit of responsibility and ownership and, and drive it forward. But I would also wonder too, though, have the conversations maybe just... 
I think when you continually have chats, even like tonight, we're having chats and we're talking. Sometimes, you know, people don't realize what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, it's just when they have open conversations and they reflect on what's going on, they might realize, you know what, maybe there is another way of doing something. So I wouldn't rule everybody out early. I would say, you know, have those conversations and try and keep as many people involved as possible. But there is opportunities there for people to get involved if they want to change culture. Another here from Frank Burke. He's a proud Monaghan man here. Well, should you enter two teams in an under-14 competition if you have 25 under-14 girls without any under-12s? We find a lot of girls want to play competitively and know the difference between friendlies and blitzes, etc., and competition. Okay, play one team. No problem. Play one team. Win your championship with your 17. I'm not talking about you, Frank. I know Frank well, Aiden, so don't worry about it. But yeah. I think, think about this in terms of um, if you win a championship, right, and you're 25 players on the, on the bench, think about this. Are 25 players in your panel, you win, a, say, you win a championship or a league, whatever it is, and you only play 18 or 19 players all the time. Can you imagine if you won the league or championship when you gave everybody an opportunity to play in equal time uh, or whatever adequate time? Can you imagine the, the feeling of that? as opposed to just playing the same 17-18. What I'm saying to you is, in our own club, we have in our philosophy that up to semi-final stage, everybody gets adequate game time. Up to semi-final stage. But if we get to semi-final and final, we deem it win games. That's okay. But the players know, okay, guys, we're in the semi-final final. No, not every player might be playing this, but we guarantee every player adequate game time throughout the year. So the point I'm trying to make is, if you have 25 players, Maximum you can run on the pitch is 15. That's 10 players looking in. The last time I checked, I've never seen players get better on the bench. So if you can enter two teams, and if your long-term development and your goal is to develop players, better players, more players, involved longer than I put in two teams. That's only my opinion. And that's only our club's opinion. We have three or four more here at the minute. I know you all. If you have enough adult players, do you use underage players? And at what age do underage players come into the senior squad? I think it's simple. If you have enough adult players, leave the players play at their own age group. Think about this. If you bring up players, uh, say I'm a senior player and I'm playing in an adult game, and I see a younger player come in before me, how do I feel? How do I feel? You know? So think about that. How do your players feel when you do that? Again, it goes back to what are you about? If you're about players developing, more players involved, more people involved, then you'll do the right thing. If you want to win the game or win the championship, then you'll do another thing, okay? And that'll be, okay, we just play our best 17, 18 players. Also, when you're bringing players up, just be thinking, just because you have a girl who may be strong and she's very strong under 18, she might have the maturity to be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a dressing room of adult players. So think about that. If you are bringing up players because you don't have enough players, think about their maturity levels. Just because they're strong and they're a good player on the pitch, do they have the maturity to be in a, a dressing room with older adults too? There might be players who are not so good at, at under 18, but you know what? They're more mature. So just think about those aspects. So they're just all things to think about if you're going down that route. But the question I would ask you is, like we saw there earlier on the guidelines, if always just talk about these scenarios, what if this happens? How are we going to go about it? Just have those conversations. So when they do arise, you all know what to do. That's the key to it. It just takes away that uncertainty. And every club is different, Aiden. These are just ideas. Yeah. Every, every club is different. Yeah. How do you prevent an older team pulling from a younger team? I have an under 13 panel of 25. I want to keep this squad together. And the under 16 coach cherry picks under Goes 13 back. players for their team and causes hurt for the under 13s not chosen. Goes back to your coaching guidelines. If you read the coaching guidelines we have there in our own club, if you have enough numbers in your age group, you do not go near the girls in the younger age group. It's very simple. And the coach abides by the club's policy and guidelines. And if the coach decides to do his or her own thing, then the club can say, well, can you explain why, why are you going against the grain here? What is the issue? What is the concern? And you'll probably find out from having those conversations, is his or her values, beliefs in line with the club's? are their objective and purpose in line with the clubs. And then the club needs to make a decision. It's the club that guides it. The club needs to take that governance and control. How to deal with a player who doesn't focus at training and distracts other players? 
Um, I would leave that for that's not for another webinar. We have yeah. a full webinar. And if you go into our LGFA YouTube channel, guys, we have a webinar on how to coach a teenage athlete and player. There's a lot of good strategies and ideas in that. I think that's another topic, and we will be highlighting that in the coming webinars as well. So we will focus on that. But that just goes down to coaching behavior and coaching beho- approach. If you go into the LGFA YouTube channel, we have a coach and a teenage player, and there's some very good strategies there on how to deal with players who probably don't engage in training. How to attract more players to try the game at younger age levels, for example, under eights. Yeah, how do you just create the positive environment? Yeah, Club great. school link as well. Club school link as well, Aidan, yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you presents in the school? You know, have you got posters in the school? You know, have you someone going in there giving flyers out about, the, about your training, about what you're doing? You know, even having a poster in the school would be great. That school, school, school club link is fantastic. Have fun days, open days, have come and try days. There's initiatives like Get It For Girls. Try out those sorts of things. I'm just conscious of time, Eden, and, I'm, and, I, and I'll come back to any more questions as we go along. But the document that we showed earlier on about our own club, all the questions you've asked there, guys, when you read through that document, just give a look and see does it answer the majority of them. But it does because we've had those conversations in our own clubs. What do we do if? What do we do when this scenario happens? Uh, this year... That happened. Okay, how do we prevent that from happening next year? And just put it into the guidelines. It's only two pages long. It's very simplistic. It does not have to be a book. So we're looking at the key ingredients. So what we're going back to is our objective and purpose. If you don't have clarity and purpose on where you want to go as a club long term, I don't know where you get where you want to go. Your values underpin that. Are you clear on them? And your approach, how you go about it. So have you that just somewhere that you can refer to? It takes the emotion out of things, takes the opinion out of things, and it just, it's about the club. This is what we're trying to do. If you want to be a long-term successful club with sustainable growth, you'd have those three things in place. Coaching structure, coaching environment, coaching practice. Everything that we discussed there. If you want short-term success, then you might have good coaching practice, but there might be much leadership going on. You might have one or two of them working well for short-term success, but long-term, you need them all function. So to finish off, let's go back to our original question. I asked you to start based on, you know, what do you think, you know, from the presentation in terms of your coaching climate? I'm going to put up the poll now again, and I'm going to ask you, does it change? So I, it was very interesting to see earlier on, you know, now from the discussions, and if I was to ask you that question now again, to rate your club, of one to five, okay, I think there was 50%, I think, that deemed their clubs good to excellent, and I think about, sorry, 5% good to excellent, and 50 average to below. I'm going to launch the poll now. Based on all our discussions tonight, and based on what we're talking about, the structure, the environment, and the coaching practice, how would you rate your club one to five based on our discussions? Off you go. Off you go. That's very interesting. Keep going. Wow. wow. Make sure to let me know, Will, because I can't, I can't see the results. <laughs> That's very interesting. So let's look at what we had before I, uh, we had the presentation. I asked the question. I asked you to rate your club from one to five in terms of structure, environment, coaching practice. We had about 45%, a bit more, that said it was good to excellent. And the rest said it was average and, and, and all the way down. The results here, Aiden, just let you know, so 23%, 24% say that it's now good to excellent, and 70-odd percent say it's average to extremely poor. Guys, that's great reflection. But take what you've learned tonight now and just go away and reflect on it on, on, on the coming days. Can I also highlight, change takes time. Change of culture takes time. It could take three, four years. But if you feel the conversation needs to be had around this area, then can you be the person that would lead that conversation? Or can you get a few people together and just have a conversation around it? So to finish off, a question was asked earlier on, Aiden, about how do we start the conversation? Here's a simple thing you can do. Get all key stakeholders and key personnel to meet in a room. As of COVID at the moment, guys, you can do it virtually. I would probably try where possible to do face-in-face when the restrictions come back, 
you know, it might be a good idea, but if you can do it, you can do it virtually and have that informal chat. Get parents in a room, get coaches in a room, get the exec in a room, do it individually, do it as a group and just ask the straight questions. From a coaching perspective in our club, what do we need to continue to do? What do we need to start to do? And what do we need to stop doing? Okay, so even if you ask those simple questions, you're starting conversation. And when you start conversation, you'd be surprised what comes from that. You say, oh, we'll do this next year. And then you review that. And you can you'd be surprised after two or three years how it all builds and builds and builds. And in three or four years time, you could see, geez, transformation, what you're trying to achieve. So as I said, guys, there's loads of webinars coming up over the coming weeks. We hope you enjoy it tonight. If there's any questions, just come into the chat before we go. There's no problem. But look, guys, there's loads of webinars. These are all recorded. They're up on our LJFA. Um, I know there's a few coaches asking about how do you deal with players who don't engage. I know there's a few people asking about uh, other things like, you know, team building activities. We have webinars recorded. They're up on our LJFA YouTube channel. Please, guys, please go and visit that over the coming days. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Aiden, I just want to say thank you very much for tonight. We hope people enjoyed it. If people have any questions or anything coming in, I'd be happy to answer. But um, I'm going to stop the sharing now of, this, of the screen. I'm going to stop the, the recording as well. I'm just going to stop the recording.